So, the penultimate talk for today is by Julien, who is joining us from the beautiful city of Lausanne, or to be more precise, Equiblon, where EPFL is located. Uh, you should definitely, if you're, if you're doing Scala, you should definitely pay EPFL a visit, um, uh, and uh, at the minimum to take a picture of the Scala stairs, which are real, by the way. So, those are real stairs, off of which the uh, logo is modeled. And yeah, Julian is uh, working at the Scala Center, and I think you're uh, concerned with the MOOCs. Yes. So if you have, uh, if you have done one of the courses on Coursera, then chances are this is based on on, on your work the, the or yeah. your organization, yeah. something like that. And uh, so for a change, this is not about free monads, but about free arrows. And uh, yeah. Yep. Please say welcome for Julian. Thanks, Zach, for the introduction. So, um, this talk is about free arrows, but not just uh, arrows. I'm not going to explain what uh, arrows are, but I'm, not, I'm more going to compare them with applicative functors and monads. So, who is familiar with applicative functors? <laughs> Almost everybody, and who is familiar with monads? Almost everybody, and who is familiar with arrows? Uh, only a couple of people. Great. Um, and then uh, my claim is that arrows are more powerful than applicative functors, but less powerful than monads. So they can be a very interesting choice when you want to apply the principle of least power that we have heard uh, at the beginning. And also, if you are looking for a new pro programming uh, paradigm, you, you may want to have a look at arrows. So, yeah. Uh, in order to compare um, arrows with applicative functors and monads, we are going to compare, on one hand, the expressive power that you get from each of these notions of computation. And on the other hand, um, the consequences of having great power, actually. And I think a nice way to illustrate that is to uh, separate description from interpretation. And I think that's something maybe you are familiar with. Um, who knows this distinction between uh, uh, description and interpretation? Oh, maybe nobody? Okay, let's, let's have some quick examples. So, this is not a pipe, right? What is this? A picture of a pipe. That's a picture of a pipe. That's a description of a pipe, right? Okay, another example? So, this is not a title. What's that? That's a description of an HTML document with a title. And uh, a possible interpretation of this description is what your web browser does when it renders the HTML document, right? Last example. This is not an addition, right? What's that? That's a description of an addition, and eventually it will be evaluated by uh, the JVM uh, to compute an addition. Or we can think of a different interpretation. More generally, for arithmetic expressions, uh, Another interpretation than just evaluating them could be to optimize them. Like if you add with a zero, you can just uh, remove the addition. Or another interpretation could be to uh, pretty print the, the expression, right? So the whole benefit of separating description from interpretation is that you can have several interpreters for the same description, right? So these are some examples. So basically, the work of an interpreter is to make sense out of uh, a given description by transforming it, analyzing it, and generating something out of it. What about description? What do we need to describe something? So in this talk, I will uh, use, uh, um, I will base description on an embedded language which will use atoms as simplest uh, forms of descriptions, and then operations that 
tells us how we can combine these simple things into more complex things. Okay. So um, the idea is to have a long language to describe something, and then see um, when we when we have applicative operations on this language, what kind of things we can describe with this language, and what what kind of interpreters we can uh, implement for this language, and do the same with a monad or an arrow, and we will compare uh, each of these notion of com computations. So what are we going to describe? Um, data. For instance, uh, a data type. Uh, here, um, an example of data type is this user record, which has two fields, name and email. So this box here is a description of a data type with two fields, right? So we want to define an embedded DSL in Scala that uh, makes it possible to describe such uh, data type. And we also want to support some types, not just record types. And then, what kind of inter useful interpretations can we think of? For instance, um, interpreters that would uh, serialize and deserialize an instance of the data type, the data type. Uh, an interpreter that would generate some machine-readable or user-readable uh, documentation for the data type. We can also generate, for instance, lenses for the data type or a form uh, for user interface to, to uh, create or update uh, instances of the data type, right? Does that make sense so far? Okay. So how are we going to describe, to define our language to describe data types? We can do it in a lazy way by just defining every, a lot of abstract things and we will see later how we can implement this, but let's try um, to, to start with something simple and abstract. So we define a type data of A, which, will, uh, which values will represent a description of data type A. And we will introduce only one atom that uh, describes uh, a data type with one field that has a given name. So what, ca what kind of things can we describe with this, with this very simple language? Well, we can describe uh, a data type with one field named X, for instance, like that. And, okay, let's see if we can describe something more complex, like, for instance, this user class here, which has two fields, name and email. So we want to create an instance of data of user. We know how to do that for one field, name. We, we, we know how to do that for the email field. And now we really want a way to combine these two descriptions into a single description that will uh, contain the, the two fields, right? That's what we want to do. But in the definition of our um, language, we, we don't have such an operation. But do you know which type class can give, of, can give of, of us this operation? Applicative, yeah, I heard it, yes. Yeah. So we need the, the, the power of applicative functors. They, they have an operation, an operation that does just that. So again, I'm, I'm lazy, I'm just pretending, so this is all abstract, but I'm pretending that at some point that there is going to be an applicative instance for the data uh, type. And um, once I do that, then I benefit from new operations provided by, by this uh, implicit instance for data, and I can explicitly import a, a, a nice syntax for, for this operation with this import. And for instance, one of these new operations is the tuple operation here. So here I can use the name value, the email value, and I can combine them into a single value that tuples them together, right? That gives us a data of a tuple string string. What we want is the data of user, so we, we just have to convert the, the tuple that contains this informa information into a user. We can do that uh, by using the, the user constructor. And then we, we again use a new operation that's provided by the applicative functor instance. Is that okay so far? Okay, perfect. So, <coughs> We are happy. We have a language powerful enough to describe records. Um, and uh, yes, uh, just in case, um, 
in our case, the, the benefit of having uh, an applicative functor in our language is that we are now able to combine uh, several definitions of fields into a single definition that aggregates all the fields. And that works not only with two fields, that, that, work, that works with uh, an arbitrary number of fields. Okay, so we are happy with our description of user, but that's, that's just a description, right? We, we also want to, to do something useful with it, so that's, when, uh, that's now that interpreters come in, into the, the, the scene. So, um, interpreters, we can define them just by impl implementing the data desk uh, trait. And the first th thing to do is just to define a concrete type for the abstract data of a type. So for instance, if I want to define um, an interpreter that uh, gives decoders for uh, my data type descriptions, so in, in my case, I'm not decoding from JSON and for, or from a binary, a, bi a binary file, but I'm assuming that I have some form of uh, key value store that stores uh, information of the field of uh, my data type. And I want to extract some A data type from this key value store, basically. Okay? So the first thing to do when you write an interpreter is to fix this type, and then you just implement the, the, meth the method uh, straightforward, straightforwardly by following the types, basically. So I'm skipping the implementation for the sake of uh, consciousness. Um, what kind of other useful interpreter we can think of? Well, for, for instance, we can have a documentation interpreter that will uh, compute um, a machine readable or so, some sort of uh, documentation that describes the structure of the description of a data type. So in my case, I can describe a record as something that has a list of fields, where each field has a name. Okay? And then, once I've fixed this type, I just implement the, the, the method. Okay? So, I have an actual implementation. I'm having this program that describes the user data type, as I described in the slide. And then the program I'm going to, to actually execute is this program with the documentation <coughs> interpreter. And in this documentation interpreter, I have implemented a JSON schema method that basically takes this record and turns it into some JSON, JSON schema um, uh, representation. And then also I take the same program and I apply the map decoder interpreter to it and then I try to decode a user from this key value store which contains a name and an email field. Okay? So what do we have? First we can see the, the schema of the user so that's a user object with two properties, names and name and email. All right. And also we see that the decoded user uh, succeeded. Okay. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah. Any, any questions so far? Perfect. So I can continue. <coughs> so we have been able to describe records. What about subtypes? For instance, uh, is our language uh, powerful enough to describe uh, this shape, data type, that can be either a circle or a rectangle. And uh, the way we will represent a shape in our key value store uh, uh, is to use this uh, additional type uh, field here to discriminate between either a circle or re a rectangle. Okay. So um, uh, let's try to describe this data type. We know how to de describe a circle. It's easy to describe a rectangle. And then what we want to do is to combine the, 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 the type field and we want to be able to say according to the actual value of the type field we want um, to describe either a circle or a rectangle. So unfortunately an applicative functor does not give us such an operation, right? So well, as you might have uh, guessed um, we will find this operation in a monad. So if I just um, uh, trans uh, change this line to, to be a monad of data instead of an applicative of data, 
Now I get new operations, so I get new powers. And for instance, now I'm able to write uh, this piece of code, th this for expression that I was not able to write previously. And now I can say, okay, according to the actual value of the type field, uh, I will able either um, describe a circle or a rectangle. Okay, nice. Um, so in our case, the, the fact that our data abstract type is a monad gives us the ability to describe um, a, a part of uh, a data type according to, to the actual value of one field of another data type. So that's very powerful. It makes it possible to describe some types. So now what about interpreters? Let's have a look at the data interpreter. So it's the same, um, the same signature. And actually the implementation of this, of a monad for this type is um, straightforward or so. So I'm skipping the implementation. But for the documentation, it's maybe more interesting. So let's uh, give some more details. Um, I want, so the documentation uh, interpreter fixes the data of a type to a record, which lists all the fields. And what we want to do is to implement monad of data. So what is monad of data? So far, I didn't give any detail about that. So what you have to do is to implement these two methods, point and bind. So let's make it simpler and let's substitute the data of A uh, type for occurrences with uh, its right hand side record. And um, so let's start with the point operation. We have an A and we have to return a record. So the best we can do is to, record, uh, is to return a record with no fields. So a record with no fields. And then bind operation, we have a record and a function that given an A returns a record, and we have to return another record. Here, the best we can do is to return the, the, the first record, right? Because we, we have no way to call the f function, because we have no a value. So that's how we can implement the documentation interpreter. Let's try it. So the program is the same as before. We want to print the JSON schema of the shape and the user types and we try to decode some values. And so decoding works as expected. But if we look at the schemas, uh, the schema for user has no properties at all. Oh, we have lost all the properties. And the schema for shape, uh, it has one property type, but we have lost the circle uh, radius and, and things like that. So do, do you have an idea of why did we lost this information? Because you're dropping one part. Yeah, exactly. So if we go back here, because we are not able to, to call this f function, we, we, we cannot use the, this uh, record, the information that it, in, it, in this record, uh, in a useful way. So um, that's why we are, we are losing uh, information. So, um, a little summary. From the user point of view, we have been super happy to, to have the, the power of monad because um, then it was possible to describe some types. But from, at the same time, from the interpreter point of view, um, it made it impossible to implement the documentation interpreter in a useful way. I mean. So the, the question is now, is, is it possible to, to find a better trade-off? And indeed, uh, arrows can give us a better trade-off, so that's uh, what I want to explain now. <coughs> so arrows are um, a notion of computation that takes two type parameters. So it's a bit different from monad and uh, applicative vector in that sense. So here I have an in and out types. So, so basically you can think of an arrow as something that takes an in and returns an out at some point. And then the, the feed constructor will turn a raw data type, like for instance our key value, to, key value store, into an actual uh, string uh, value containing the, the, the value of the feed that we are interested in. Okay, so I, am, I have to introduce this raw data type. And then we just pretend that we have an array of data available. So now, if I say that, 
what kind of operations do you ha do I have in my language? Uh, so I can illustrate these operations with this piece of code. So for instance, to describe this user data type with two fields, as previously, I can describe the two fields, and then I need a way to combine the two fields together. And in the case of a row, the operator is a bit different. It's n, n, n. So this is very equivalent to the tuple operator that we have seen with applicative functor, actually. And it gives us uh, a data that takes an arrow and then returns a tuple containing the two fields. But what we want, what we want is to have a user here. So we, we also need to, to apply uh, an additional transformation. We want to, to turn this tuple into a user, so we are going to use the constructor. And then <coughs> you can see here a new operator, which is named and then, which allows us to chain the two computations together. So in case that looks a bit cryptic, it's also possible to represent this computation as a nice uh, diagram like this. So we see that the end operator uh, combines two arrows in parallel, and also we can see that the uh, end then operator combines these two arrows, this one, the big one here, and this one here, combine these two arrows uh, sequentially, right? So, uh, yeah, that's what we get with an arrow. We can define processing steps and uh, combine them sequentially or in parallel. Great. What about some types? <coughs> so, back to this shape data type. We can describe the circle, we can describe the rectangle, we can describe a field with type. And now we want to say, okay, according to the actual value of the type, I want to describe either a circle or a rectangle. And unfortunately, just arrows don't have uh, this operation. So we need a new um, abstraction, which is named choice. And so, so I'm refining my, my, da my uh, data desk uh, trait. I'm saying that for data, not only I have an implicit arrow in available, but I also have choice. And now, so don't look at this part. It might be a bit cryptic, but the nice thing is that I can say, okay, according to the type, it can be either a circle or a rectangle. So now I have this OR operator. Okay? And the way it works is that here I can say, according to the actual value of the type field, uh, if it's circle, I can signal that it's a circle using either a left or a right. And here I'm using left to signal that I have a circle and right to signal that I have a rectangle. So now I can statically describe that um, according to the value of uh, the, file, the, the field type, I will have either a circle or a rectangle. And that's a nice diagram uh, with uh, or. Yeah. So basically, or is a fan in operator that makes it possible to merge uh, alternative branches of a computation. Okay, so now the interesting question, is it possible to implement uh, a meaningful uh, documentation interpreter? Uh, so let's try that. So again, <coughs> we have to implement uh, this documentation interpreter. So first we, we have to fix the, 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 these abstract types. So, in our case, we will not run any computation uh, at all. I mean, this, uh, this data A, B, or in, out, as I uh, wrote in the beginning, will never run any computation because we just want to describe something. So, the row type can be just nothing. It, it will be useless anyway. And then what we want to do is, is to be able to describe uh, algebraic data types. Algebraic data types are either records or some types or coproducts. Uh, coproducts are a list of alternative records, right? So that's a, a, sim a simplified model of uh, an algebraic data type. So finally, my data uh, type is edit. <coughs> okay. So now let's see what we have to implement to implement a row with choice. <coughs> So first, we have to implement compose operation. So this one, 
So first, let, let's make it simpler by substituting again uh, occurrences of data with its right hand side, right -hand side uh, namely ADT. So Compose, the, the goal of Compose is to combine the, the, the feed of two um, descriptions of records. So basically we, we have four cases, either we, we have um, records with records or coproducts with coproducts or a combination of coproducts and records. So in the case of records, that's easy, we just concatenate the field. In the case of coproducts, we just concatenate the alternatives. And in the case of uh, a mix, we just push each, all the fields of a record into each alternative of the coproduct. Okay. That's one operation. Choice, the, the second key operation. There are two other operations, but I will not mention them. Choice, uh, we, we have this complex uh, type signature, but let's simplify it again. <laughs> it's much more simpler. The, choice, the purpose of choice is to just um, model the fact that we can have several alternatives. So if we have <coughs> an alternative between two records, then we have a coproduct uh, between these two, two records. If we have an alternative between two coproducts, we just merge the, the alternatives. And uh, if we have one record and a coproduct, we can just uh, add the record into the alternatives of the coproduct, and so on. Okay, so okay, now I can show the demo because I have an actual implementation. So if I run the demo, so again, I have user, shape, description, and I try to decode. Decoding works. And then, if I uh, look at the, at the JSON schema for user, I get back all my fields. And for shape, now I have uh, this uh, one off thing that can either be a radius with a field type and a, field, uh, a circle with a field type and a field radius, or a rectangle with a field type and a field width and height. Okay? Nice. So that's quite uh, cool, I think, because uh, with one description of my data type, I can generate uh, machine-readable documentation. I can also generate a decoder. In my example, that's a decoder from Map, but that could be a JSON decoder or a protobuf decoder or anything like that. But uh, the point of the talk is to compare uh, arrows and applicative functors and, mon uh, uh, and monads. So. The interesting <coughs> point here is that uh, arrows are really uh, in between applicative functors and monads because uh, we saw that we have more power than applicative functors because we are able to describe more things. We, we were able to describe <coughs> some types that was not possible with just applicative functor. But at the same time, uh, we didn't restrict the space of possible interpreters because when we had a monad, we were not able to implement the documentation interpreter, but that was still possible with uh, a rose. Right. That's a very interesting trade-off, in my opinion. So in that, in that example, I, I used uh, a description of data types uh, in the talk, but arrows are very useful for describing lots of other things, like basically any uh, pipeline of uh, processing steps. They are also useful to describe functional reactive programming, uh, functional reactive programs, maybe. YAMPA is an example of a uh, library that, that's based on arrows. So, yeah, as a summary. So first, we compare the expressive power of operation provided by three notions of computation, applicative functors, arrows, and monads. We observe that when we, when we increase the expressive power from one point of view, so for the point of view of the user, at the same time, we decrease, we, redu we reduce the space of possible interpreters for, uh, for this language. So yeah, there is also a very interesting talk from uh, Renard uh, about this uh, topic. And uh, yeah, we saw that uh, arrows can provide uh, an interesting uh, middle ground between uh, applicative functors and uh, monads. So uh, that's it. Do you have any questions?
So arrays are one of the older concepts in functional programming that have been invented quite a long time ago. Uh, in Haskell, I'm only aware of a single library that uses uh, arrows extensively, which is Hexamol or something like that, which is for XML processing. Uh, do you have any idea why it hasn't caught on that much yet? No, I have no idea. Mm, maybe because there are less uh, powerful than monads, and monads are very convenient to work with. Sometimes it's quite hard to, to correctly write the graph of computations that you want to, to describe with arrows. Sometimes it's just uh, easier to use a for expression. So that can be one of the reasons, uh, but uh, I don't know really. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, at some point, free monads kind of became popular, so maybe 2018 is the year of free arrow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yeah. I've heard in certain circles that um, uh, the use of arrows has become a little bit unfashionable um, in part because uh, you, you could do most of what an arrow does with a strong profunctor. Mm -hmm. for, uh, that set of people being the set of people who understand what a strong profunctor is, <laughs> I guess. But um, uh, the, the stuff that you've demonstrated here, does that require the full power of an arrow or, or can you do it with... with uh, you know, uh, less constraints. Look, look at the so, for example, uh, um, oops. here I'm using the, this R method that does not exist in a strong profiler. Sure. But, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. That's the only difference between them is the, is the R yeah. function. Yeah. Yeah, very cute. Yeah, so there's a construction to create uh, free monads, there's a construction to create free applicatives. Do you know if there's a construction to create free arrows? What do you mean by, by construction? Well, if you, take, um, if you take something that's not a functor, for example, there's a way to embed it to another data structure that's going to make to be a, a free functor for that thing, mm -hmm. right? Same thing for free monad. You take an ADT, yeah, you, you, you can do the same, or okay. you can do as I do here, in a kind of uh, finally tagless approach. Instead of reifying uh, a rows operation as a data type constructor, yeah. I'm just uh, pretending that they are they, they are available implicitly, and uh, and that's equivalent. But we, we could also use the same approach as we 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 commonly use for free monads free and monads. reifying all the operations of a monad as a data type constructor. So you can re reify first, second, and, and then that would be it? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay cool. Yes. Hi. So it seems to me that if um, you have only one way of creating a uh, data object, which is this field thing, right? And then you only combine them using your, okay. Now, suppose you had another one where you could say, okay, I want to extract this field and uh, then compare it to some value that I provide, and if it's not the same, it will fail. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, it seems to me that you could uh, not extend to an arrow, but go from applicative to alternative, uh, and then use that for parsing. Uh, how, do, how do you think that would compare to the arrow-based approach? I'm not sure alternative will uh, make it possible to do what you said. You want to be able to, for instance, extract two fields and uh, then have uh, some predicates that, according to the value of this field, uh, continues uh, some other form of, com of computation? So th um, the idea would be to uh, <coughs> construct... So what was the example you had with shapes there? I think it was a circle and... What was rectangle? It? Yeah. Re rectangle, right. And you had this type thing, so you could build a parser that would parse the type and fail if it's not circle. Mm -hmm. And then you have two additional parsers um, for what was it? Uh, the radius probably and the center or something. Mm -hmm. um, and now you have a parser that can parse a circle if there's a type that says it's a circle. And you can use the alternative operator to do the same thing with, to combine it with a uh, parser that you constructed the same way for a rectangle. 
Okay. I might be wrong because I'm not extremely familiar with alternative bits, but I think uh, the difference here is that um, I will not try both alternative, the circle and the rectangle. I will really choose which one of alternative I want to, to go in. And with just uh, applicative with alternative, you might uh, try all the alternatives and just select the first one that works. I think it's getting a bit technical, so maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the break. So let's thank the speaker.